Hey everyone and welcome back to another Warcraft video. So, Soulbinds, right? They're one of the major modes of progression in this next expansion. They're going to impact you quite a bit, and the good news is that we have tested them out on the special event Realm the Blizzard did for their big announcement a few days ago, and we also asked the game director, Ian Hazakostas, a burning question that many people have had. Why are they destroyed when they are replaced? So, today we're going to hear that from Ian, and then we're going to actually hop in-game to get a feel for how these Soulbinds and conduits actually work and the types of powers you can expect to get for your character. So, to uh, kick us off and to hear Blizzard's reasonings for pretty much the whole thing, this whole system, let's hop on over to the interview and then after that, we'll hop in game and we'll take a look. Just moving on to the rest of character mm -hmm. customization. Um, part of what ties it all together is the soul binds, of course, and uh, part of that is conduits. So, I think yeah. a big community question right now is... Covenants, from what we understand, they operate like gems. So if you put a you know, if you put a conduit in and then you put another one in, the original one is destroyed. So overall, I'm kind of wondering like if that is filling a a sort of a similar niche to maybe like a major or minor glyph, but you know isn't really tied to profession in terms of the economy and the need for scarcity. Uh, what would the team's essentially like design thinking or goal mm -hmm. be in the consumable nature versus going for just them being items in your bag to so you just swap around or maybe a library like system like essences? Yep. So the conduits are going to be you know, earned from dungeon raid bosses, PvP vendors in some cases. Our current plan is for them to drop, not like Relics did where they compete with other loot slots, but as a bonus drop when they drop. So that should, should be an improvement over how things were back in Legion. But they feel like items. They do feel like gems. We're actually currently talking about putting a little bit of passive stats on them, even just stamina in some cases to offset the throughput benefits that are coming from this system. And so there's a couple of reasons for destructibility. Um, because they feel like items, they feel like things that have stats on them, and thus like gems, if you could just pop them out, then the right way to play would be this really massive nuisance of inventory management, of having your massive collection of, of conduits off to the side that you're physically hoarding and swapping in and out. That doesn't sound terribly fun. But a bigger philosophical reason is choice. Um, what is and, and what choice means in World of Warcraft and what customizing your character means. We already have a ton of systems and decisions that you make on a very micro level, on an encounter by encounter basis or when you're beginning a Mythic Plus dungeon. And you can change your spec, you can change all of your equipped gear, you can, within the Covenant system, change your Soulbind, which Soulbind you're going to bring, which path of the soul line is going to be active, which talents are active. All of those things you can shift around. Then there are other things that are less mutable, like obviously your class, your race. Uh, covenants themselves fall towards that end of the spectrum. And conduits within the soul line system offer much more customization and flexibility than relics did, where if you were a ret paladin, you know, your Ashbringer just had these three relic sockets and you, you really didn't have the ability to have two different Ashbringer loadouts. Whereas with Soulbinds, there are three separate Soulbinds and different paths within the Soulbinds. And part of the thinking is that that's where the permanent customization will lie. Um, if you know, the, the uh, Nadia's tree, which we showed in the stream yesterday, which you can see in the build that you have access to right now, um, going down one branch of it, there's a duelist trait that is really emphasizing single target DPS that makes you do more damage to a single target that you're focusing on. Uh, it's likely that so that's going to be an attractive soulbind and soulbind option for someone who is doing a you know single target raid boss encounter, and you're likely to want to put conduits in that line that synergize with single target damage. You might have a different line that seems to have more of an AOE type benefit, and you'll put AOE conduits in that one and respec accordingly before you go to a dungeon. Or if you have utility survival perks in a soulbind tree and you want that one active, you can have conduits that synergize with that. Um, across all three soulbinds, there's quite a few conduit slots. These aren't going to be ultra rare items. They're, they'll be you know, generally available from a wide variety of sources. And we are loath to add like an extra, extra layer of micro changes that you feel like you have to make and that really given the way theory crafting guys work that you're supposed to make before you enter a given situation where it's not just, hey, I'm going to pick my AOE soulbind to go do this dungeon. 
It's I'm going to replace and resocket these five conduits and then re redo them for this other dungeon because of whatever reason. Yeah, so um, the worry is then yeah. like an add on can just sort of do the whole thing in one click, really. It's, I mean, it, it's sh sure the mechanical inconvenience anyway. is part of it, but yes, I mean, uh, and anytime players are looking to add ons to automate or streamline something, I think it's a sign that we've created a system that has, you know, there, there's there's inconvenience and nuisance and too many individual decisions that all need to be made simultaneously that aren't actually interesting decisions. Like it's just a template or a loadout that you're copying from somewhere and stamping in. Whereas I think the decisions of how you're going to customize your soul binds in a way that hopefully makes you a little bit different from other people because these are the conduits that you happen to get or stronger versions of them. And this is the build that you have gravitated towards that has these strengths and weaknesses that there is a core of RPG customization that lies in those differences, as opposed to if it's just a checklist where everyone ends up ultimately being identical and you're either following the right path or you're doing it wrong and there's, there's either conformity or, or, you know, going your own way and thus doing it wrong. Um, not, not, nothing is really terribly interesting about that. And adding additional layers of those types of decisions don't really add much. They just turn into more chores that you have to complete in order to be optimal. Yeah, cool. That, that helps explain, like, sort of at what level the decision making like kind of is in the stack. Um, if I was to do a quick little follow up in conduits, um, mm -hmm. from my read of what you said, then if we're doing a, say like you're a tank healer DPS, right? Yeah. Uh, would that be a situation where, uh, because your soul binds don't change the loadout based on your spec, is that a situation where if you're a tank or a healer, you're going to probably have a soul bind that you'll gravitate to and therefore that's the one you'll spec uh, sort of in that manner with your conduit choices? That's that seems likely. I mean, it's, it's going to be different depending on the exact types of content you're doing. If you're a hybrid versus a pure, but if there's one of the soul binds that offers more utility survival based options, that probably isn't the one that you're going to gravitate towards for your ret spec, but you might for prot and put synergistic conduits in it. And then that soul bind and, and its loadout in terms of which path you've taken through the tree are saved and associated with that spec. When you respec from ret to prot out in the field, you just have the soul binds pre-slotted, ready to go, and you can do what you want, but it's the product of choices that you've made to build that out. All right, everyone. So now that we've heard from Ian and we basically know what's going on, I think it's now time to actually just hop in game to play around with the system to actually get to grips with how it works and how it feels. So let's go do that. All right, everyone. So here we are. I am in Sinfall. This is the Venthyr, uh, the Venthyr Order Sanctum. And uh, yeah, you know what? Pretty spooky looking place, what you'd expect. But of course, today we are here for business. And that business is the Forge of Bonds. And that is where we do our soul binds. And what I'm going to do today is a live walk you through this and also explain the conduit system, of course, with that conduit system being something that we now have a little bit more context on now that I've actually talked to Ian about how it works and about Blizzard's thinking on why you're not able to, uh, you know, swap them out without destroying them. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to right click here. Now, the way to think about this really from what Blizzard is saying is these are your three choices, right? These three, uh, these three soul binds. The idea is that you sort of progress and build out out each soul bind with conduits, but then when you're actually playing the game, you're not thinking about swapping your conduits in and out, you're actually thinking about which soul bind do I want to be in. So whether you like it or not, that basically is what Blizzard's intent actually is. So let's go look at the soul binds. And what you might find here is really that, well, it's interesting. They're not all about combat. There's actually quite a lot of flavor put throughout these. So let's just go with um, Nadja the Mistblade. So her first one, right? Agent of Chaos, Door of Shadows, Disorients, all nearby enemies at the target location for eight seconds when you appear. So to give you an example, that is something that interacts with Door of Shadows. Door of Shadows is the Venthyr Covenant ability. Now it's not a class based one. Everyone will get it. So if I, you can see here, use it, bam. And with that particular one, enemies will be disoriented when I do that. As another example, though, if I go over to uh, this character, Theotar, he's got Leisurely Gate, which makes Door of Shadows have a 30 second increased uh, dirt, like um, cooldown, but cast instantly, basically making it a, tar a ground targeted blink, which is pretty damn cool. So you can get up to some wild hijinks. If you're, you know, you're a void elf, you're using this, and you're also a mage or a monk or something, a lot of movement. So that's what's going on. Now, the 
way that you actually progress down this tree is mainly dictated by your choice of conduit. So if I go to an empty tree here, the general Draven tree, you can see here there's a finesse conduit, a endurance conduit, and a potency conduit. And then over here, there's an endurance one. So if I was progressing down this tree, right, I would select between one of these two abilities. Let's just go with anima infusion for now. And then I would socket in an endurance conduit. Once that's done, I would then be able to select one of these. But the thing is, these three traits are also tied to three different conduit slots. In this case, a finesse, endurance, and potency one. Really, potency ones are where you're going to be getting your throughput for your character. Uh, but there's an example here where, well, if you want to go with the potency conduit, you've actually got to then go with hold your ground, which is a defensive soulbind talent. So that's kind of how that's balancing out, basically. I doubt you're going to be getting much, you know, many situations where you get a potency conduit slot that is then paired with a high throughput, uh, you know, like talent on the soulbind tree. Because if Blizz did that, then everyone would just end up picking that one. So... That's basically how this is working, and uh, I believe the way that it is, is that the more renown you get, the further you'll be able to progress down your soulbind tree. And then, of course, as you do more of the, uh, the Covenant campaign, you'll unlock more soulbinds. So yeah, we had Agent of Chaos, which we covered. There's then Fancy Footwork. Door of Shadows increases your movement speed by 80%, decaying over 6. So there's another example of it interacting with your Covenant ability. Now, for the conduits to give you really, and th these conduits will be important, I think. They're almost like minor, they're, they're kind of like glyphs, basically, in the sort of effects they have. Though I believe Ian did say to me that uh, they also are thinking of putting stats on them, which then I would imagine would help to balance them. But anyway, anyway. Uh, yeah, so there's the conduits, right? Uh, so with her, you actually get to choose between a potency and an endurance based on the choice you make here, and then everyone gets a finesse conduit, which then takes you into friends in low places. You loot 20% more infused rubies, and dredgers throughout Revendreth offer you an expanded selection of goods. Now, this is another example of something that's on your soulbind tree. It's not going to matter in a dungeon or a raid. It's actually just augmenting your experience in the zone of Revendreth. So, this again goes with Blizzard's plan of making it feel like you are more at home in your own Covenant zone. Now, for from that point, we then get to choose between three different conduits, which of course are each tied to their own uh, traits here. I don't know, traits, talents, whatever you want to call them. So, uh, exacting preparation. This is wild. The benefits of well-fed flask and weapon enchant effects increase by 15%. That is just a massive flat stat buff. That's going to be hard comp uh, to compete against. However, it is tied with a finesse conduit. In this case, the one that we've went with uh, means that the cooldown of blink is reduced by a second. But think about that. That is that is pretty darn massive. What if you wanted to go with a potency conduit? Here's the thing. You could get a potency conduit that would maybe match really well with one of your legendaries or something like that, which might actually be enough for you to want to give up a 15% bonus to well-fed and flasks. Now, this one is tied with familiar predicaments, which means the duration of incoming interrupts, snares, and root effects is reduced by 25%. So, yeah, I mean, cool in PvP and stuff, but not really that good if you compare it to exacting preparation. But I think, again, then you obviously see the Blizzard are balancing this system by the type of conduit you're able to pair these with. And then if we move on to the final one, you'll have to choose an endurance uh, conduit. So that's one that is, of course, the endurance and finesse ones, by the way. They are class specific, while the potency ones are spec specific. So you'll have to go with an endurance and then you'll get Dauntless Duelist. The first enemy you damage in combat is marked as an adversary. You do 4% more damage to them. They do 2% less to you, but you can only have one adversary at a time. And that is an example of Nadja being a little bit more of a single target sort of themed soulbind in terms of what she does. And then finally, then you will just get a potency conduit and then that will lead into Thrill Seeker. And this is kind of a fun one. So when you're in combat, you gain a stack of Thrill Seeker every two seconds or four stacks when you kill an enemy. So if you think about some raid situations, there'll be some raid bosses where, you know, a whole bunch of trash dies. Bam, you're going to get a whole bunch of Thrill Seekers. That could be quite fun to play with. Then at 40 stacks, you uh, your Thrill Seekers are consumed. You get Euphoria. That speeds everything you do up by 20% for 10 seconds. And then it decays rapidly when you're not in combat, which I assume is just so you can't cheese it before a boss fight or something like that. So that's a pretty darn powerful ability, and I think you can really see how you could build Nadja into, uh, 
I guess into a very like sort of dungeon and raiding friendly build. I mean, you're getting a benefit to your well fed and your flask. And then if you're dealing with a lot of trash, you've got Thrill Seeker to play around as well. And it really seems like that could all be quite strong. Now, if we move over to another example, Theotar the Mad Juke, well, he's a bit weird because if you look at his, there's Watch the Shoes, which is your door of shadows, frees you from roots and snares, which is pretty cool. You've got Leisurely Gate, which is the one we already covered. These then, of course, are tied into conduit slots. Then we've got Refined Palette, the effects of combat potions last 20 to 100% longer. Are you, uh, are you mad? Do you like a little bit of RNG, a bit of madness? Certainly this is going to be the one for you. I could imagine that being decently frustrating to some players. It almost reminds me, of, I mean, come on, imagine playing Roll the Bones plus this. Your opener is going to be all over the place. So that's a bit of a wild one, to be honest. Then you've got Soothing Shade. Your uh, spells and abilities have got a chance to summon in. Basically, Tubbins and Gibbons are like his kind of, his boys from the quest thing. Uh, and then they basically just give you a little area you can stand in to get 10% more mastery. And then there's this one, which grants a shield that absorbs 800 damage to allies whenever they uh, heal you or buff you. And only one ally um, can get a shield every 20 seconds. So... Again, three different options, pretty darn different from Nadja, though, in terms of the overall design. Then, of course, what's interesting is if you look here, we go, um, you know, we got all these, but you can actually double up on the endurance. Whereas over here with her, you're doubling up uh, or you could double up with a potency here and a potency here. So the balance is kind of interesting because if you actually tally them up, you can go for three potencies with Nadja, but you can only go for two potencies with Theotar. So again, this is that kind of style of balancing where Blizzard are trying to make it this really big, right, sort of cumulative decision. And that's kind of how they want you to be engaging with that. Now, as we move on, then we've got Life of the Party which basically is just a buff to the Ember Court, which is um, kind of like the mini game that you get. So during it, your guests gain additional happiness for every event completed. And when it concludes, the effects of the decrees uh, bestow uh, bestowed upon you are increased. So basically, uh, you get buffs, right? You get buffs to the Ember Court and they will, you know, you'll get sort of benefits afterwards. Then there's Impeccable Style, where he will just cover the cost of transmogs and uh, exquisite ingredients, where he'll send you an assortment of herbs and uh, when you complete uh, activities that contribute to your Great Vault. So again, you can see with Theotar, entirely different to Nadja. I mean, if you're going to be raiding and stuff, you probably want to be going with Nadja, especially if you want to be rolling out that deeps. Uh, now, that said, it could be changed by Theotar's final one, which again, we don't know. Now, if I was to a bit more quickly cover General Draven to just sort of give you an example there, basically, right, this one is about your, your durability. This one is, um, you know, again, like sort of regen out of combat. So these are kind of like more utility things. But as we move on, Standing Still gives you a uh, stamina buff. So this is more of a tank one, right? Because that stamina buff actually does slowly decrease, um, you know, for, well, it, it basically it persists for four seconds after you move. So if you roll with that and you're a tank, it's going to be pretty helpful. Then there's superior tactics, which means it's successfully interrupting or dispelling um, will actually increase your critical strike chance by 10% for uh, 10 seconds, but it can only occur once every 30. So this is a pretty interesting one where I really do feel like there's just some classes that can make incredible use out of that. However, once again, balance is interesting because if you, uh, you know, if you're going with this, right, you're going to have an endurance conduit here. You're going to have an endurance one here. Yes, you'll get another potency here, but then you've got a finesse and endurance. So again, the balancing of this and actually doing that arithmetic in your head, it's very much going to depend on what conduits do you have to play around and how do these actually play into your, you know, your spec, your class. So then we move on. We got built for war, which means that when you're above 80% health, you gain one, uh, well, your primary stat every three seconds, 1% of that stacking up to five times. And if you fall below 50, the effect is lost. So you can kind of see, you know, if you're a tank, you're going for this. If you're a DPS, maybe one of these two. Uh, then as we move on, we've got enduring glue. Uh, Door of Shadows grants you a shield that absorbs uh, absorbs damage equal to 15% of max health lasting for 8 seconds. So that's again a pretty nice survivability one. And then this move is one. When a nearby ally gains temporary uh, movement speed increases, you actually get some of that benefit up to 30%. So again, pretty cool. And then finally, call to action. Mirrors of Torment grants 10% versatility to you and 4% to um, up to four nearby allies for 15 seconds. Now, that is your, like, your Venthyr Covenant ability in this case um, as a mage. Right. So you can see, as you are getting different conduits, you know, if you are thinking of more of a sort of single target, or you're just, you know, maybe more of a basically, right, more of a raiding dungeon sort of set. You can really see how you be sort of getting your potencies. You maybe be thinking about, do you want to end up building for this, for your well-fed, your, you know, your flasks being buffed? It's definitely something where there are going to be clear answers for every single class and spec as to what is the right one for each situation. But you'll certainly have examples where maybe Draven, if you want to, if you're a tank, maybe a few of Draven's abilities will be better for you. 
so you're probably going to want to go into him. I suppose if you are, you know, maybe between AoE and single target, you could have slightly different builds, and we'll get into that when we cover conduits. What is cool, though, is you can actually swap between these on the fly. Now, if I am out in the world, I can access that by clicking this button, okay? Now, here we can see a few different things. There's our callings, which are kind of like your emissaries. Here's your mission table, but then your soulbind powers. So I can actually click in this. It brings up that menu. Now, I cannot customize the soulbinds, but what I can do is swap between soulbinds pretty easily. Easily. So, now I'm Draven, now I'm Theotar, and I'll use Theotar to very quickly teleport over to, um, to our conduit guy. Now, these conduits, of course, are something that are, is basically an addition to loot tables. It doesn't take the place of regular loot, but it is on loot tables of bosses. This is purely an NPC here for testing, but again, we're going to go through these so that you understand how conduits actually fit into the overall picture. So, this is, of course, for the Frost Mage, or for the Mage. Uh, basically, the way it works is the Endurances and Finesses are class-specific, and the Potencies are between the specs, and we can see all of the different uh, all the different potency ones here. So, if we go to Cryo Freeze, right, when you're inside Ice Block, you heal 15% max health over however many seconds. So that really is a, a pretty obvious one, I think would be quite nice to have. You've got Diverted Energy is another one, your barriers heal you 20%, uh, you know, the damage that they absorb. You've got Temporal Barrier, you gain a shield that absorbs 5% of your max health for 15 seconds after you blink. So if you're getting, you know, maybe two of those into your soul binds, you, you know, you can see, right, if you build a soul bind to maybe be more built around one of these, you know, you can start sort of tailor them to situations you're going to be getting into. Now, if we move on to Finesse, Winter's Protection just isn't implemented yet, but you've got Grounding Surge, uh, which means it's successfully interrupting an enemy with Counterspell, reduces its cooldown by a second. You've got Flow of Time, which basically just reduces the CD of Blink by a second. You've got Incantation of Swiftness, where your Invis increases your movement speed by 20% for 6 seconds, which is pretty sweet. And with that, there's actually not that many of them, but I think this is a system the Blizzard want to add into as the patches go on, so I imagine there will be more finesses and uh, endurances as time goes on. But if we then move on to Arcane Prodigy here, so Arcane Missiles reduces the cooldown of Arcane Power by 0.1 seconds. So that is an example of the scope of change that you'll be getting from a potency. So if we then move on, you've got Nether Precision, where consuming clear casting increases the damage of your next two Arcane Blasts. You've got Magi's Band. Touch of the Magi accumulates an additional 5% um, of the damage that you do. So there's you know, some examples of how you're going to be messing around with these, to be honest. I know less about Arcane than the other two specs. To finish them off, Artifice of the um, of the Archmage, your Arcane Barrage has a 10% chance to grant two Arcane Charges. So I guess if you want a bit of RNG spice, this is a pretty good one for you. Now, onto the more familiar territory for me. So with Infernal Cascade, when Combustion is active, your Fire Blast grants 3% fire damage for 5 seconds, stacking up to 3 times. So, yeah, if you get 3 Fire Blasts out, you're just going to get a pretty flat damage buff, which of course is happening in your major damage window. There's Master Flame, so Flame Strike damage and its radius is increased by 6%. I think that's pretty good, to be honest. I've always wished there was a bit more flame strike in that rotation anyway, so there you go. Maybe, again, you can see if there was, let's just say you're in maybe another covenant or something like that, or there's a soul bind that really meshes with your AoE, then you could start to build in something like this, and then you kind of see how these things are going to be built around, especially if you then perhaps get a legendary, and that legendary maybe augments your flame strike you can kind of see how this stuff's all going. Now, then we've got Flame Ascension, which means that Fireball grants 5% mastery when it fails to critically hit. And we finish it off for the Frosty Boys. We've got Shivery Core. Blizzard damage and snares increased by 5%, so not that big, but perhaps that's the sort of thing you could stack up. You've got Unrelenting Cold. Frozen Orb damage increased by 10%. Again, your clear AoE there. Uh, when Icy Veins is active, your crit hits reduce its cooldown by 3 seconds. You've got Ice Bite. Increases the damage of Ice Lance against frozen enemies by 10%, which is pretty sweet. And then Siphon Malice. Each time Mirror of Torment is consumed, a Mirror of Torment is consumed, your spell power is increased by 10% for 10 seconds, stacking up to three times. Now for that, again, just got to look there. Mirrors of Torment, that is your Covenant ability, so you will be having conduits that actually impact your class Covenant ability as well. So that's essentially what's going to be going on, right? If I just open up the, you know, the finder here, we go to the Halls of Atonement, our loot table's done. No, they're not. But in these loot tables, you are going to be finding conduits, okay? You're going to be getting those conduits. You're going to be coming back here. You're going to be putting them into your soul binds and working out what the hell you want for your character. That is basically the core of how this system works. It was interesting talking to Ian, as you've heard, where... 
you know, t to me, right, I, I did sort of see it as, are these not a library of things that I could sort of get and have in my bags and swap them in and out? But no, that's really not what Blizzard's design is. We'll have to see how the balance of that actually evolves over time. Maybe they put some stamina on them or something like that. But yeah, you can see that basically you'll be kind of progressing. You'll almost certainly, right, choose your first soulbind to work on to get fully maxed up with conduits. But after that point, you'll kind of be progressing each one of your soulbinds around some sort of idea of what you want it to do and how you want it to fit into how you're playing the game. Maybe it's AoE and single target. Maybe it's open world gameplay versus Mythic Plus gameplay. Whatever it is for you and your character. And then you'll build your conduits around that. And basically, rather than that be a big system of very laborious tweaking, Blizzard's intent is you just slowly progress each one of those soulbinds a bit closer closer to where you want it to be, and then the actual sort of day-to-day decision-making that you're making as a player is you're out in the world, right, and you're just working out which one of these do you want your character to be in. So, that is the current version of the Soulbind system and the Conduits. It's what it actually is playing like here on the event server from the recent summit that Blizzard did that they very kindly gave us access to. I would love to know, what do you think about this, right? Do you, uh, you know, now that you've heard what Ian's uh, explanation is for why these are operating like gems and how the scarcity is being managed, do you agree with it? Do you think this really is just the sort of thing you fire them in to slowly build it up, then you forget about it and you're really only caring about which one of, uh, you know, which soulbind you want to be in? I'd love to know how you think you'll engage with that system. I'm sure Ian and the rest of the team will as well, so please do let us know what you think there. Other than that, thank you for watching this video. You know what? It's bloody nice, right? Because we do so many, you know, so many bits of content over there in, you know, in that chair with the big Ursa Mini, the nice professional camera. I mean, I'm filming this in a black magic pocket, so it's still a pretty sweet camera, but we're basically using it as a webcam, essentially, aren't we? So it's quite nice to actually be sitting down with World of Warcraft and a, you know, and a keyboard and, uh, and actually doing that. Really should do that a bit more often, shouldn't I, instead of it just being lore and news. Anyway, food for thought. Thank you for watching. Let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time.